Today, we'll be creating this epic scene. We're just going to use a few basic shapes and see where we land up. To start off, we're not going to delete the default cube, and instead, we're going to use that as an object in the Geometry Node modifier. So let's click and drag from the bottom right over here to create this new window, change it to the Geometry Node editor. We're going to press New to add in a new Geometry Node tree, and we're not going to use the group input for now, but we'll use it later on. We'll keep it over there. Now we're just going to search for a curve circle, and we're going to plug that into the geometry, and we're also going to duplicate this curve circle, and we're going to convert the curve into a mesh. So we're going to search for a curve to mesh node. With the curve to mesh node placed between the curve circle and the output, we're going to plug in the other curve circle as our profile curve and we get this donut shape whose radius we can control like this and thickness we can control using this slider. So for now, we're just going to have the radius at something like 8 meters and we'll keep thickness at something like 0.5 meters for now. The next thing is we want to actually instance this group input, which is actually a cube, onto all of these faces. So for that, we're just going to have to distribute some points on faces. And once we plug that in, we can go ahead and apply instances on points. So once we place the instance on points over here, we actually need to supply the instance. So that's going to be our group input. So we can just plug that in over here. Now you see all of the cubes are of the same size and in the exact same orientation, just placed randomly. But we can go ahead and play around with the rotation and the scale. So for the rotation, I just want all of them to be very random. So I'm just going to search for a random value. And because we wanted to rotate on x, y, and z axis, we need a vector and we can't just use a float. And we can just plug that into the rotation. Now, ideally, the max value should be 2 pi. So we're going to go ahead and supply a value of 0 to 2 pi, which is one full rotation. And that just gives it a lot more randomness. Now, all of these cubes are a little too large for my liking. So I'm just going to go ahead and reduce the scales to something like 0 0.2. If you feel like this is still too large for you, you can definitely go around and change them. So I've kept it at 0 0.15 and with that we can move on to the next step of the process. We actually want this to curve around some other object to create wacky random shapes. So to do that, I'm going to have to realize the instances so that we can actually make changes. Let's search for a realize instance node and plug that in right there. And then press shift A and search for a curve circle. Now let's rotate the curve circle on the x-axis by 90 degrees and then grab it on the x-axis and just bring it 8 meters to the side. Since we know that the radius was 8 meters, 8 meters to the side will bring it perfectly to the center. And now with our geometry node object selected, we can go to the modifiers and add in a curve modifier. And for the curve object, we're going to go ahead and search for the Bezier circle that we just created. Now we can just change the deform axis to get something that we like. And I think the best one looks when it's placed with the deform axis of Z. So that looks like a really cool shape right off the bat. And I think that's exactly what I'm going to use. However, I want the bulk of this shape to be present on the top and not the bottom. So I'm just going to rotate it on the Y axis. But if you actually try rotating it, you'll see that it just messes up because we're using the curve modifier. And of course, if this is the animation that you want, it's also a pretty cool animation, but that's not exactly what we were looking for. So instead, what I'm going to do is just rotate my camera while placing it. So let's go ahead and actually do that. So let's press Alt G and Alt R on the camera with the camera selected to clear its location and rotation. Then we'll just grab it on the Y axis and move it back to about there and then rotate it on the x-axis by minus 90 degrees so that it's upside down. And that's what we actually wanted. And we can grab it on the x-axis and just move it a bit more towards the center. And once we're happy, press zero to go into the camera view. Now, obviously very little is seen in the camera, but we can grab it on the y-axis and just move it back till we're happy. However, I also want to change the focal length of the camera. So I'm going to go to the camera properties over here, change the focal length to something like 25 and then grab it on the y and move it front. So once you're happy with the placement, you can go ahead and add in a ground plane just to hide the bottoms. So we can search for a mesh plane by pressing shift A and adding in a plane and then scaling it up. And right now you won't be able to see it because it's perfectly in line with the camera and has no thickness. So to see it, we just have to grab around the Z and move it down a bit and we can move it to just below our object. And that looks pretty good. So now I can select the camera and fine tune the position of my camera. So I've just grabbed it down on this Z axis and I'm just rotating it on the X axis to get it a little higher. That looks fine by me. And I don't want to see anything outside the camera. So under viewport display of the camera, I'm going to increase passport out all the way to one. And let's just switch off overlays. And that looks good for now. This plane, I also want it to be much larger. So I'm just going to scale that up to about eight and that should do. Now I want to add in all of the peripherals before I get into shading because I can make chapters on YouTube much easier that way. So I want some more detail to be added to this. And to do that, I'm just going to press shift D Y Z and just move it on the Z axis till we get another variation. We can just place that a bit in front of the first one. And that looks good for now. And the reason why I'm doing that is because when we actually place a lamp in between these two, the one in front will be far darker and the one at the back will be brighter and that'll give a good contrast. This to me at least seems a lot like a throne or something. So I want it to be protecting something important. So of course you could make a throne, you could make a sword, 
you could make a crown maybe but what i'm going to do for my render is just search for a uv sphere grab it and bring it down here again you can press seven on your numpad to go to the top view and just make sure that you're placing it in between so this is about the area that i want it to be placed and then i'm going to go ahead and add in a displace modifier to our uv sphere and you can press new to add in a new texture and then go to the texture properties down here and change it from image or movie to clouds and that just gives it this nice rough look and then back in the modifiers properties you can increase the strength a bit and then you can add in another subdivision surface modifier just to smoothen that out and increase the levels to two or three and then you can always go to object shade smooth and that much is everything for the actual modeling and now we have to deal with the texturing although there might be a few changes in the modeling later on so for the texturing we're going to first go ahead and switch on all of our defaults so let's go to our render properties switch on ambient occlusion bloom screen space reflections and underneath that we're going to check refraction as well and then we're going to go to our output properties change the frame rate to 30 frames per second and the end frame to 300 and now we can change from our solid viewport shading to rendered viewport shading to see what we have and we can change this from the geometry node to our material review. But before that, remember in our geometry nodes, we have to set the material. So let's just select it, go to our modifiers properties and select the geometry nodes and just set material as well over here. So let's search for a set material node and plug that in right there and choose material. Now that you've done that, you can change this from the geometry node editor to the shader editor. Now let's give it its material. So essentially I want it to be a little metallic. I'm just going to increase the metallicness and reduce the roughness a little bit. And then I'm going to change the base color to make it slightly golden. And I'm going to switch off overlay so that I see what it's actually looking like. And personally, I feel like it's a bit too thick. If I just hide a second cube, this looks a lot better for now. So we'll work on this and then add in the second cube later on. So let's just continue to reduce the roughness till we get nice specular reflections, increase the metallicness as well. And then we're going to take our light. We can select it from the outline over here and press Alt G to clear its location. And then we can switch on overlay so that we can have to see where it is and then just grab it to about there and then grab it on the Y axis and just move it in front. And that's what it currently looks like. But everything is too bright because our background is still gray. So let's go to the world properties and change the color all the way to black for now. And this is what we have. But once you see that, you can change the colors to suit exactly what you want. So I'm going to make this color palette be between yellow and blue. And that's what it's going to be used repeatedly. So this is going to to go a little bit more towards the saturated yellow side and i think i'm happy with this particular color now if i unhide cube 001 this is what it looks like and although that's all right i feel like it's just not what i wanted and i think that's because our lamp is currently in front of the second one but we wanted it in to be in between the first and the second so let's select it and grab it on the y and just move it in between the two so now when you actually look at it, this is what it looks like. And I think that looks a lot better, but there's a lot of changes that we still have to make. The first thing is that we need some sort of light in the foreground to actually see this better. But the way I'm going to do that is actually add in some bump so that all the ambient light is reflected on. Let's actually search for a Voronoi texture. We're going to change it from Euclidean to Chebyshev and we're going to search for a color ramp and we're going to place the distance factor into the factor of the color ramp. We're going to bring the black in a bit and the white in a bit and we're going to plug this into a bump node. So let's just search for a bump node and it's going to go into the height of the bump node and we're going to plug the normal into the normal. So when you do this, you see a bit of bump has been added and that just reflects a little bit of the light on this side. However, the scale is still far too off. So we have to increase the scale to something like 20 and that just adds in quite a bit of detail. And then we can select our initial light and then press shift D Y and just move it in front like this, but I don't want it to be this bright. So we're going to reduce it to something like 500. And now we get our shape. Now we can texture our main object. We can press new to add in a new material, go to the material settings down here. And remember, we can change the blend mode from opaque to alpha hash so that it actually becomes see-through. And we're going to switch on screen space refraction. Then for the transmission, we'll just increase that all the way to one. And we're going to change the shadow mode to none. Now, ideally, you should have been able to see through it, but we're not able to. And that's because I switched transmission roughness to one instead of transmission. So let's go ahead and increase transmission all the way to one. And now it's actually transmitting we can reduce the roughness as well a little bit so to see if it's actually transmissive I'm just going to select it and then press shift s cursor to select it so that if we add any object it appears right where it is so let's add in a uv sphere and then just scale the uv sphere down and you can clearly see the uv sphere through our glass material so it is 
glass. So let's go ahead and add in a new material for our UV sphere and change it from a diffuse BSDF to emission BSDF. So we can press shift S and that allows you to just switch the type. So we're going to switch it to a shader of emission and there it becomes an emissive material. We can increase the strength to something like 10 and we can actually reduce the size a little bit and we can change the color to the blue that we were talking about. Along with that, on our actual glass object, I'm just going to reduce the roughness and increase the transmission roughness a little bit so that it gets deflected inside a little bit more here and there. And I'm also going to change the base color to a complete white with a slightly bluish tint. So that is our magical object in the center. So now we can press zero to go back to our camera view. And now we can go ahead and shade our floor. So the floor is going to be very similar to what we've done in previous videos. So we're just going to add in a new material, search for Voronoi texture, change it from Euclidean to Chebyshev, shift D to add in another one, plug the distance into the vector of the first one, and then plug the output of this into a color ramp so that we have more control over the contrast, plug the distance into the factor, and the color output is going to go into a bump node. Let's search for a bump node, and this is going to go into our height and the normal into the normal of the principal BSDF. Now, if you don't see any changes, that's because our scales are far too large. So let's just increase the scale on our first Voronoi texture to something like 100, and on our second one to something like 20, and you should be able to see it. So I think we have we'll have to make it. 500 and that looks a lot better. I'm going to reduce the scale of the second one down to five. Down to two seems all right. And I'm going to, as usual, make it a lot more metallic and reduce the roughness quite a bit. And I'm going to give it that same bluish tint that we were going for. So just a very, very slight bluish tint. So now what we have to do is make some areas very reflective, which is going to act like puddles. And we're going to use the same technique that we used in a previous video. So we're going to search for a musgrave texture and we're going to search for a color ramp and we're going to plug the height of the musgrave texture into the factor of the color ramp and the color is going to go right into the roughness of our principal BSDF. And again, we're going to have to play around with the scale quite a bit. So I'm going to increase the scale to something like 500 again, and I'm going to increase the black and I'm actually going to switch the color ramp to put the white on this side and bring in the black so that we just get these puddles of water and it comes in. I've chosen a scale of 200 and if this is what you're looking for, that's perfectly all right. However, I want a little bit more noise to be added to this. So I'm just going to search for a noise texture, increase the scale of that to something like double of the musgrave texture. So let's go with 400. Let's duplicate the color ramp, plug the color of the noise texture into the factor, and we have to mix these two. So we're going to search for a mix RGB and we're going to change it from mix to multiply. I'm going to plug the color into of the noise texture into the second socket, increase the factor all the way to one, and then plug the color of the color ramp from the musgrave texture into the first color socket, and then plug this into the roughness. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and just play around with the color ramp and the scale to get something that you like. So I've gone with a scale of 1000 and something like this, and I'm happy with this particular result as of now. Now, the next thing that has to be done is the actual world background. So we're going to change it from object to world, and we're going to use a similar technique to what we've used before. So we're just going to search for a noise texture and a color ramp, and we're going to plug in the color of the noise texture into the color ramp. We're going to bring the black in quite a bit and the white in, and we're going to change the white to this bluish color, and we're going to reduce the value to something fairly low. And the strength of the background is also going to be reduced to something like 0.4, and we're placing the color into the color of the background node. Now you can see it in the background but it's a bit too large so I'm going to increase the scale to something like 8 and I'm going to increase the detail to 7 and the roughness to 0 0.7 and if you can see it that's perfectly all right however I feel like I'm just going to increase the black in quite a bit and then increase the strength from 0 0.4 to 0 0.7 and that's going to act like our background however the background if you actually look at this region right over here you can see a clear differentiation between the background sky over here and the floor it's like a flat line and I don't actually want that to be seen. So to change that, we're just going to search for a gradient texture. Let's search for shift A and gradient. And now if you actually control shift click it with the node wrangler switched on, you can see what the gradient looks like. And it's currently in the vertical direction. I want it to be horizontal. So I'm just going to press control T with node wrangler switched on to get the texture and mapping coordinate nodes and then rotate it on the Y axis by minus 90 degrees. And now you have a perfect black at the bottom and a gradient that goes up to white over there. So we can just multiply these two. So let's search for a math node or a mix RGB set to multiply. They're both going to work the same. So now you can place the color from the gradient texture into the second factor, increase the factor to one and the color from the color ramp over here. And now plug this into the color of the background node. 
and then control shift click the background node to get the desired output now this area is completely dark and it's starting to be seen on top however i think i'm just going to have to increase the strength quite a bit so i will now go with the strength of 12 and that's what we have the plane can be seen till the end because of the lights that's present from the background now so i'm going to have to reduce this strength back to something like 0.8 and i'm just going to increase the value over here a bit and it's always going to reach to the same thing so one way you can fix that is by actually ordering out the outside of this plane so i'm going to do that i'll change back to the object with the plane selected i'm just going to search for a spherical gradient let's search for a gradient texture change it from linear to spherical Control shift click it to see what we currently have now add in extra coordinate and mapping nodes with Control t and search for a color ramp place that in right over here and switch it from generated to object so that it comes out from the center and we can just bring it in like that and now we can go ahead and change the base color of this to whatever color we had over here so we can just hover here press ctrl c hover here press ctrl v to add in the color and now plug this into the base color and ctrl shift click the principal bsdf that way the objects in the far end are going to be completely black and hence should not reflect enough light to be seen and that is the type of smooth gradient that i wanted from the floor into the sky now there's no no straight line that's visible which is absolutely perfect for what i wanted and that's everything with related to modeling and texturing now the last thing that we have to do is animating before that we can set all of our animation defaults so we can come to our output properties change the frame rate to 30 frames per second change the end frame to 300 so that it's a 10 second long animation we can change the output to wherever we want to store it file format is going to be ffmpeg video and our encoding is going to have a container of mpeg4 and output quality of perceptually lossless then we're going to switch on overlays select our camera remove this shader panel so we're going to right click and click join areas and just bring it down and then increase the timeline now let's go to frame one tap n and then go to view and click camera to view and then back pen again now let's start off at some side location maybe something like this let's just switch off overlays again now that we've selected our camera we don't need the overlays let's start off somewhere like this tap i location rotation scale then go two seconds down the line so frame 60 maybe rotate it so that we have like a front view and of course use the values in the object properties over here to guide you i know that this has to be minus 90 for it to be perfect this has to be zero for it to be perfect and this should also be zero for it to be perfect and then we can just grab it a bit on the x-axis and just move it to the side so that's centered and then we can press i location rotation scale then let's go to something like 120 and just Go down and zoom in we can just continue zooming in and once you're happy at it so, such that you are seeing the object is all of the numbers to things that make sense so zero 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 grab it and move it till it's centralized and if you can't tell if it's centralized you can always open the guides so you can go to the camera properties here viewport display composition guides switch on center and switch on the overlays you'll be able to see the line coming through and you can clearly see how this is centralized on the horizontal axis not centralized on the vertical axis so we can go ahead and just increase it on the z a little bit till it's perfect perfectly centralized and then press i location rotation scale then let's go to something like frame 180 and rotate on the x-axis so that we get like a skyward view of this and grab it on the y-axis just a bit further behind grab it on the z-axis to move it down till it's just above the ground there press i location rotation scale then by 240 we can grab it on the y-axis and move it back then rotate it on the x-axis grab it on the z-axis and just move it up rotate it on the x and essentially this should be the angle from which we actually rendered everything or modeled everything grab it on the x and move it back y and move it back till about that yeah grab it on the y switch off overlays this is what it is so press i location rotation scale and then if you want it to be perfectly looping you can take the last frame shift d grab it and move it absolutely to the end that's going to be frame 300 and then it's going to be perfectly looping so in order to get this to be a little smoother at least the motion of the camera you can press a to select all of the keyframes change this from the timeline to the graph editor press alt shift o to sample keyframes but before that just make sure that you save your file and then press alt shift o with the cursor in the graph editor and once you have all of the keyframes sampled you can press alt o to actually smoothen them out and you can press this many times so something like 40 times and it'll just be a lot smoother so with that the only thing that's left to do is actually render out your animation hopefully you learned something cool with this and again every time you attempt something like this it's going to be something completely different and you just have to apply your own imagination to get different results i hope you can do something super creative and until you do more videos are coming out on this channel so stay tuned and stay creative